hello everybody. Um, we're just going to wait a couple minutes, make sure that everybody gets in here. Um, we had a tremendous response to this webinar, so we're looking forward to seeing around 900 of you. Um, it's just going to take a second to get you all in. While you're all coming in, if you wouldn't mind just letting us know in the chat box where it is that you are from, um, your city and state, and uh, just give us a quick hello so we can see you all. Awesome. So many. Wow. <laughs> Look at it. I can't even read that fast. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Great. Shout out to New Englanders. It's like a blur. <laughs> that is great. Wow. Um, as we're just letting everybody in here, um, just because there is so many of us today, we're going to put all of our questions into the Q&A box and the chat will just be for your general hellos and um, um, if you message us in the chat, um, because there's so much chat, we may not catch it. So uh, please use the Q&A for any questions and answers. Um, and again, if you're just joining us, pop into the chat, tell us where you're here from. Uh, we'll get started right away here. There's lots of familiar faces there. Sarah Sisna, hello. Mm -hmm. Some of our friends from Calgary are here. Awesome. All right, well, I feel like we'll still get some people straggling in, um, but we got, we got a lot of you here. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Kareen Kessel, CACP, and she's gonna kick us off. Amazing. Um, so my name is Corinne Kessel, CCP. I'm from the ILEA Vancouver chapter and I'm on the ILEA Board of Governors. Um, so I'm excited to have you all here today. Um, I hope you're keeping well and I thank you for joining us. Um, I'd like you to welcome you on behalf of the ILEA Board of Governors and the COVID management team. We have a great conversation for you lined up today and we're looking forward to getting right to it. Um, I would just like to ask quickly if you can pop it into the chat if uh, you are a member of ILEA and what chapter you're from. Um, that would be great. And just in the next slide. Uh, if you are a member, please log into ileahub.com uh, and log in and update your contact info. We know that many of you um, are experiencing change um, in your job and personal life. So we would like to keep in touch with you and ensure you get access to all of your member benefits and any information um, that we're able to send out. So, and as well, we'd like to offer any support. Um, if you need it, please reach out to um, the Board of Governors or any of your leadership team. We're here to, we're to, here to help you. So on to Stephen, the reason we're all here. Um, we're so glad to be having a conversation um, today focused on what comes next. It's my pleasure to introduce our colleague Stephen Adelman today. Hi Stephen. Stephen is the head of Adelman Law Group, which is based in Scottsdale, Arizona, which is focused on dealing with risk management, safety and security at live events throughout North America. He is also the vice president of the Event Safety Alliance an international trade association which promotes life safety first throughout all phases of event production and execution. He is a professor at the Arizona State University in sports law and business program. He is a chair of the task force group creating the new ANSI standards for crowd management and for event security. He is also leading a very exciting collaborative project right now to provide guidance for small events called the Event Safety Alliance Guide to the Grand Reopening, which is looking to help event professionals safely reopen events following the coronavirus virus shutdown. So he will share more about that. On to you, Steve. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kareen. Um, so I'm Steve Edelman and, you know, get used to this face with this voice because I'm now going to share my screen so that we can go through some PowerPoint slides. Let's do 
slideshow from the beginning. And through the magic of PowerPoint, there we have the grand reopening. Grand is in quotation marks. That is intended to be ironic because, well, it would be awfully nice if the reopening was grand, but I suspect it's going to be small, phased. Um, it's going to be problematic. Some people will get it as well as they can. Some people will just charge into the abyss and probably get people infected and mess things up. Um, so the goal here is not to predict the future. I can't. Um, not to teach you medicine. I'm a lawyer. Um, but rather to talk about basic operational issues, um, because that is what I deal with for a living. And to go through an analytical framework for assessing the risks that you face and to try to mitigate those risks in a way that's meaningful for you under your circumstances. So I don't have all the answers. I promise you I don't. But I have some, and more to the point, I'm going to give you a way of thinking about this so that you can puzzle out your own situation in a way that makes sense, which is legally defensible, and which, God willing, will yield relatively few sick people, because that obviously is the end game. Uh, so what you're looking at here is, well, six feet apart. Um, this is an area in Scottsdale, Arizona, uh, which is where I'm speaking to you from right now. Uh, so they painted lines on the entranceway. Um, and for the most part, people observe those lines. But as you can see in the background of this picture, not everyone can manage six feet apart, even when there's plenty of space. And so that's one of the things that we're going to have to think about together, as well as individually, is not only what should the rules look like, but how the hell do you enforce them when there is a widely varying sense of awareness of what's the risk? What's the risk to me? Do these, these circumstances matter for me? You know, I, I want to be next to the person that I want to be next to. So how come you tell me that I can't? We're going to have lots of people who need things explained to them in a way that they will be more compliant than not. We have a lot of challenges. So let me do one last bit of housekeeping. This is a, a shout out to the ILEA chapter in Orlando, um, who very generously gave up the presentation date that I was going to do, which was tomorrow, to give this talk only for them. So Jordan in Orlando, thank you and to the rest of your board. Uh, the other 900 or so of you who are listening to this talk, you owe a debt of gratitude to the Orlando chapter. Um, let's begin. So I'm Steve Edelman. I'm a big believer in having an agenda. Here's the agenda. Um, bit of humble bragging. We'll get that out of the way quickly. I'll teach you the one bit of law you need to know. We'll do a little about hygiene. Again, I'm a lawyer, but I know some things and I think they're useful, so we'll cover them. And then we'll get to the business of reopening business. Um, Here's a plug for you. The places that are going to open first are relatively smaller. Um, I was on a YouTube meeting yesterday, and there were some big tour managers and people who operate arenas and, and stadium types, and they're telling us stuff. And it was pretty close to meaningless because they're not reopening anytime soon. I didn't want to be the killjoy who reminded them of that as they're pontificating about all sorts of things that aren't going to happen now. But the point is, for you guys, because you host relatively smaller events, you're going to be the canaries in the coal mine. You're going to get to reopen in the next few days if you're in Florida or Georgia, in the next few weeks if you're in some place that has a little more thoughtful leadership. You're going to be first, which means if you have plans that you not only have thought through but are ready to implement, you're going to be the leaders who push the door open very gently for larger events, larger venues to try their hand at getting this right. 
No one's kicking the door down. That's stupid. Don't think that way. We're going to gently push the door open wider and wider just by little tiny increments. But you're the first ones to do that, which is a tremendous opportunity and a, an enormous burden. If you get it right, the economy can slowly creep back to something approaching a new normal. If, by contrast, not you, because you're on this webinar, you're already part of the, you know, the teachable moment. But if some neighbor, some other competitor, some less thoughtful person screws this up, they're going to screw it up for everybody. And we're going to lose a summer and a fall and maybe the entire year. We only have one chance to get this right, but we have many, many chances to get it wrong. So if you're the kind of person to take a note or two, get started, because here we go. Uh, so briefly, I'm an attorney. I went to Boston College Law School when I used to look like that. You've already seen a picture of me, so you know I don't look like that anymore. Um, here's the humble brag part. Um, this is from a magazine from last summer, so it's relatively recent, and I didn't even write it. Um, you know, one of the world's leading consultants on safety, security, and risk management for live events. I think that's very nice, and so I thought I would share it and even point it out to you. So. There we go, that's why I'm talking to you, because in this little corner of the world, safety and security at live events, I'm kind of a big deal. So thank you for participating. Uh, next, law. This won't hurt a bit, but it is actually the relevant legal standard for dealing with coronavirus, as well as pretty much everything else that we do. I will say it, I'll say it a second time to give you time to write it, because I want you to write this, and then I will explain the goofy picture of me and a blue man, which illustrates the legal standard. Here we go. Everyone has a legal duty to behave as a reasonable person under the same or similar circumstances. There, I've said exactly what the slide says. You're the kind of person who just takes a picture, do that too, that works just fine. And now say it again, everyone, meaning you, me, your patrons, people who are working in the kitchen, the custodial staff, everyone has a legal duty to behave as a reasonable person under the circumstances they're actually in at that time. Here in Scottsdale, Arizona, where I am, we're gonna hit 100 degrees Fahrenheit on Sunday. That means air conditioning is important, ventilation is important, making sure that things are hygienic as they come through the vents, that's gonna be important as opposed to if you're in, I don't know, Calgary, Alberta, air conditioning is something that you dream about, I suppose. And really you're thinking about heat and sweaters and you know, being warm enough at night so you don't freeze to death. Different considerations yield different responses. So everyone has a legal duty to behave reasonably under their own circumstances. That actually is the law. Here's the story that I hope will help you remember it, the story. This is a real picture, and it's a real picture that illustrates something about me, which is I love Blue Man Group, and being kind of a big deal, I got to go backstage one time, well, several times, and you know, the first time I went backstage, I was me, and I was, you know, being all effusive and wordy and saying how much I enjoyed the performance, you know, the toilet paper coming out of the ceiling and the lady you invited up to do the Twinkie thing and, you know, the percussion and the people wearing the, the crazy outfits, you know, look like skeletons. And I'm saying all this to the blue man, and he's not saying anything back. And it's kind of pissing me off because I'm used to, you know, people saying, gee, Steve, we really appreciate your patronage. And thank you so much for coming to our performance. And he wasn't saying anything like that. And it was annoying me. And so I was trying harder and harder to get him to respond. And he wasn't until finally I, you know, the, the light bulb went off over my head and I realized, oh my God, I'm not behaving reasonably under the circumstances, I'm violating the fundamental rule of law that I live with every day because the circumstances in this case are that I'm talking to a blue man. And if you've ever seen Blue Man Group, you know where this story is going. The one thing that a blue man will never, ever, ever do is talk. They don't talk, not even backstage, they don't break character. And so when I finally realized that the blue man was not going to break character and he wasn't going to say, gee, Steve, we really appreciate your patronage. He wasn't going to say anything. Then finally I stopped and 
you know, stopped talking and I made eye contact with him and he made eye contact with me. And then I started moving my body, you know, sort of undulating my shoulders and he started doing the same thing. And we started moving together. We had this moment. It was great. I have no idea what we were communicating, but it was a beautiful thing, whatever it was. And we behaved reasonably, I behaved reasonably under the circumstances of talking to a blue man because a blue man doesn't talk. That actually is the legal standard. What is right for someone in Calgary is quite wrong for someone in Scottsdale. What's right for someone who puts on, you know, a hundred person weddings and bar mitzvahs in, you know, rented halls is gonna be different than someone who puts on 500 person outdoor events with no reserved seating because there are no chairs circumstances will determine what a right answer looks like. Okay, that's really important. There's not one right answer. There's no best practice. Best practices is a stupid and legally wrong term. There's only what's best under your circumstances. So there's a typical phrase, you know, we use an all hazards approach. We consider all hazards. No, no, you don't. You don't consider all hazards. Rather, what you do is you consider all reasonably foreseeable hazards. That's the segue to talking about coronavirus, because at this point, coronavirus, COVID-19, the actual disease, is reasonably foreseeable. And it's reasonably foreseeable because well, it's a thing that isn't solved yet. And notwithstanding that, we're apparently going to soon hear the starter's whistle wherever we happen to be, and we're gonna get to reopen. So let's move on to part three of our four-part agenda. We're moving smartly through this because I wanna get to your questions. So I, I created a slide. Um, which has various pieces of wisdom that medical professionals and epidemiologists have told me because, you know, I live in Scottsdale and I know a bunch of doctors. And so I ask them things when we're out hiking or, you know, drinking on a Friday night and they tell me stuff. And these are some of the things they told me. And I think they're all true and right. And the thing that's remarkable to me about this good hygienic wisdom is, uh, it's wisdom that I knew on March 5. March 5 was the date of the last trip that I took. Um, it was a presentation that I gave in Vancouver, British Columbia, and I flew a couple of days later, and then the world shut down. So the hygienic advice hasn't really changed. It's doing the basic little kid things that we've all been taught should be done, um, you know, with the exception of social distancing, which is a term I had never heard before. But again, I'm a lawyer, not a doctor. So, you know, don't blame me for my ignorance. But this is not rocket science. The things to do to stay hygienic are pretty simple. That's good because it yields some advice. So, I, this is, well, not entirely a political comment. I'm a believer in expertise. I didn't think that was political, but at least in the States, it seems to be. So if you're offended by that, sorry. Um, I'm a believer in expertise. So if you want current medical advice, I have some suggestions. Um, the Centers for Disease Control, they have an excellent website. It's updated daily by people with epidemiological knowledge and a science background. I think that's really what the times call for. Um, the World Health Organization. I think the WHO is pretty darn good. I, I think they're solid and I'm kind of glad that Bill Gates has stepped in and continued to fund them. Um, Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine has an excellent website that updates coronavirus advice and also charts the path of contagion. So you can see how's your state or province doing. Um, not really a competitive thing, but it sort of has that effect. You can tease your friends. Um, and the Hopkins website is, I think, really good. It has more explanatory information. So between the CDC, the WHO, and Hopkins, I think there's a lot of good medical advice out there if you're the kind of person who 
well, wants a doctor to tell you things. Or you can get your medical advice from someone who doesn't know shit about medicine, but who recently has received medical care from a doctor. Um, so let's put a line through that. Um, you can get your medical advice from a WHO, but not the World Health Organization. I don't think that's a good idea. Or you can just go whole hog and get your advice from the WHO. But you know, Pete Townsend, not really the medical guy you want. So I'm just putting in a plug here for what I thought was common sense. I didn't think I really needed this slide, and yet evidently I do. So there are three pieces of advice about where you can get medical information, CDC, World Health Organization, Johns Hopkins. Now, let's get to why you've actually signed up for this webinar, which is business and how to reopen it. Uh, this is a sign from my neighborhood, and it's kind of where we are right now. The point is we want to get past where we are right now because where we are right now sucks. So here's the basic framework. And this is really what I want you to understand. So again, if, if you've got some way of recording or writing this, and I know this session is being recorded, um, but since you're going through it right now, you wanna write down that the four risk management strategies that we're about to discuss are, and this is a standard framework, you can avoid the risk, if you can. Uh, you can control for the risk if you're able to, and I'm gonna discuss some strategies that you ought to know. Um, you can throw up your hands and accept the risk, and that is what's gonna happen some places. Just don't think it's a really solid thing to do. Uh, or you can try to transfer the risk to someone else, and that has some problems now. So avoid, control, accept, transfer. Um, I'm, I already told you the legal standard and gave you, <clears throat> excuse me, gave you a story to help you remember it. Um, I'm gonna do the same thing now. So avoid, control, accept, and transfer. Um, this, this is Sunny. Sunny is a cat. Sunny is one of my cats. Um, and Sunny is reminding us that the acronym for avoid, control, accept, and transfer is a cat. So Sunny, thank you for giving us the sleepy blurb, a cat. Let's now go through the four risk management strategies, starting with avoiding a risk. So this is ways that you can avoid the risk of patrons, workers, or artists. And let's be clear, we want to address all health and safety issues to all three groups, front of house, your patrons, back of house, the workers, people who are setting up, people who are clearing dishes, people who are doing custodial stuff, especially people who are doing custodial stuff because they got to wipe everything down, people who are in an operational capacity, who have a microphone, who have a website. We want to make sure that all of those people receive the kind of health care and attention that we want them to get because we don't want anyone to get sick. So ways to avoid the risk of patrons, workers, or artists contracting COVID-19 while participating in your event or at your venue. So avoiding the risk, well, stay closed. That's one way. Now, chances are, if you're taking this webinar, that's not the option that you really were looking for. So let's acknowledge that that's really the only way to be certain, but let's continue the conversation. Testing. Well, yeah, we should have testing, but we don't. We don't have enough testing. And wherever you are, wherever you are right now listening to this webinar, you're almost certainly going to reopen without sufficient testing. Um, I leave it for other people to decide for themselves whether that's a good idea or simply a necessity, but that's gonna be the reality. Um, most places are gonna reopen without sufficient testing at least on our scale, the scale of this ILEA attended webinar. Um, contact tracing. Um, Apple and Google are working together now to do contact tracing um, using everyone's cell phone. I'm holding up my cell phone right now. Uh, this raises privacy concerns. Um, 
To me, the biggest privacy concern is a hospital room with a curtain because that doesn't afford me much privacy. So grudgingly, I personally am willing to give up some privacy over the use of my phone and my whereabouts in order to allow contact tracing so that if God forbid somebody that I get in touch with or in proximity to, if they wind up being sick, I wanna be notified. I just do, that's my choice. Um, may not be yours, but that's one of the things that is a way to avoid the risk, contact tracing. We don't have that yet either, but that seems fairly likely to be available soon. The question is, how widespread will it be? And then the last thing is a vaccine. And those of you thinking, I'm not going to open until there's a vaccine, um, enjoy your vacation because it's going to be really long. Uh, even in the most optimistic estimates that I've read on things like CDC and WHO and Johns Hopkins, 12 to 18 months, that's optimistic. Um, some vaccines are harder to figure out than others and viruses apparently mutate and change. So that's where we are. So option number one, um, care of Sonny the cat is avoid the risk and your options are stay closed or open notwithstanding that we don't have enough testing, contact tracing, or best of all, a vaccine. We're not gonna have that for quite a while. Not great options to avoid the risk. How about controlling the risk? Well, here in this scenario, you decide to reopen as soon as somebody allows you to, so as soon as it's legal to do so, um, and that's, there's already talk about phased reopening in some US states, um, starting as early as next week. Um, again, not a conversation for me to have on a webinar, whether that's a good idea or not. Um, certainly it is a conversation for you to have because reasonableness is a function of your own circumstances. And there are some places where an answer is gonna be more clearly yes or no than other places. Um, arguably New York City, sort of the, you know, the hot zone in the US still, will be a later opening place, even if everything else goes well. Uh, where I am in Arizona, we have had relatively few reported cases, knock wood, um, and to the extent that heat matters, we've got plenty of that, so I suspect we're gonna be on the relatively nearer side of reopening. Uh, but here are some risk management strategies that anybody can use to control their risk. And you recognize all these, I'm just kind of talking over them. So gloves, of course, um, masks, even if you don't have the really good N95 mask, almost anything is better than nothing. Um, Clorox wipes, Purell, if your local establishments have these things in again, get them. Don't hoard them, but get them because you'll need them. Um, gaff tape, well, remember my opening slide was painted flooring in six foot boxes. If you've got a general admission event or some place that has lines where people queue up or I don't know, food, alcohol, merchandise, ingress, you're gonna need some way of keeping people separated from other people. Um, lines on the flooring are one way of doing it. Another way is bike rack. Um, outside of my local Costco here in Scottsdale, they do a magnificent job of separating people. They queue them up in the heat using bike rack and it works. It works really well. By the way, it works really well because there are also two cops leaning on the bike rack just kind of minding their own business, but they're there to remind people, both by their presence and their words, if they are ever needed, um, why don't you back up a little, boss? Um, you'll get into the store, but you know, get off the person who's right in front of you, because that's not smart. Um, and the last thing that you see is the handheld thermometer. Um, the thing that's noteworthy about that is not that they're hard to work, they're not, uh, but that you have to make sure they're calibrated correctly because, well, they're being produced very, very quickly right now, and the knockoffs are not especially reliable. So when you open a box full of thermometers, make sure that they're calibrated correctly, test them. So these are all simple ways of controlling the risk. Are they perfect? No. Uh, 
Um, it's managing risk. It's based on the decision that you've already made to reopen either because you want to or because you feel that you have to. So these are things that you simply should do or at least seriously consider doing because they're all that we can do. We don't have testing, contact tracing, or a vaccine, but we do have abundant gaff tape. So there, you can do things to control the risk. This is the low hanging fruit part of the discussion. These are all things that no matter how small the event is, no matter how limited your resources are, you can afford this stuff. Certainly you can afford it a lot better than someone getting sick from coronavirus. So that's the second of the four parts of the risk management strategy analysis. Let's go to part three. You can accept the risk. You can't completely avoid it. And you can't completely control the risk either. Um, so you decide to proceed and treat the risk of people getting infected with COVID-19 as a cost of doing business. So in that scenario, well, we have Alfred E. Newman saying, as Alfred E. Newman does say, what, me worry? And you know, you're just fat, dumb, and happy, hoping for the best. And that is a strategy. Um, it's a strategy that arguably some of our leaders are taking and kind of throwing the decision to us to behave reasonably under our circumstances. But let's be quite clear that our desire to open, you know, our fervent desire to get back to work, and I say this, you know, this is personal for me, I'm a lawyer who supports sports and entertainment venues. My clients aren't working, which means I'm not working. So I feel this very acutely as well, but it's not just Alfred E. Newman blithely saying, I'm not worried, let's reopen the beaches and bowling alleys and hair salons. Let's remember people on ventilators in the hospitals is one part of accepting the risk, but they didn't accept the risk of being on a ventilator, or maybe they did, but didn't really appreciate that it could be them. You know, we all have this notion, it won't be me, It'll be somebody who's immunocompromised. It'll be someone who's older. It could be someone who's a middle-aged man, like this image. Um, or it could be worse than that. And you could have a bunch of lawyers arguing over the scraps of your business as they rip it apart. And, and that ain't pretty. I tell you that as a lawyer. You don't want lawyers circling like, like vultures over the carcass of your firm, over your business, over your livelihood. You don't want that. And so as you think about accepting the risk and what that actually means under your circumstances, just fix these grim face lawyers in your mind. Not me, I'm not like that. I'm a nice guy most of the time. Um, but these lawyers in this third image, they're out for blood and the blood is yours. And the blood is yours because they're going to be very, very angry that a decision that you made arguably was not reasonable under your circumstances. That's basically what they're saying. So that's the third option, to simply accept the risk. And now, Sonny, the cat, take us away, transferring the risk. Well, this used to be a happier slide um, because I, a lawyer, had some answers. I had some solutions to problems. Um, I like indemnity and hold harmless provisions in contracts, not from Law Depot. Don't buy your contracts online. That is the classic penny wise and pound foolish. But the problem is passing the risk of pandemic and the illness caused by pandemic is really hard to do as a matter of law. There's probably not a court that I can think of anywhere in the US or Canada anyway, where a court is going to uphold indemnity language where you basically force some vendor to accept all of the responsibility of somebody who comes to your event and God willing, sorry, God forbid, gets sick. Um, 
So the usual contract remedies still worth doing, but perhaps not as effective as they might normally be. Uh, indemnity and hold harmless language is really important. Uh, it's the current really important contract language. Back in the beginning of March, when stuff was canceling and we were all wondering, you know, do I have to give refunds? Is this a force majeure? What is force majeure? Is that French? I don't even, what force majeure? What the hell is that? That's part of the boilerplate at the back of a contract. I don't read that stuff. I spent a lot of time explaining what force majeure means. Now that conversation is completely irrelevant. It, it's still important to have force majeure language in your contract, but the hot issue now is indemnity and hold harmless language. The point is there's no perfect answer under contract law. There are things that we can do, strategies that lawyers can engage in, and I frankly encourage you to engage in those strategies. Talk to your lawyer or you know, talk to me, and I can walk you through the legal contract law steps, but there's no silver bullet in contract anymore. The other traditional means of transferring risk is insurance. You reopen, but you buy insurance to protect your business against having to close it again, or against the risk that somebody gets sick and sues you for allegedly having you know, unreasonably unhygienic premises. What we have found in the wake of the initial wave of COVID-19 related closures is event interruption insurance coverage ain't what most people thought it was. Um, and again, you know, I have some smart friends who I have queried about this because I didn't understand myself, but here's a, a thumbnail sketch of why event interruption coverage does not, at least so far, cover COVID-19 related business closures. And that is, event interruption coverage is a function of property contracts. So property loss. And there needs to be a direct property loss in order for business interruption coverage to kick in. And the current position taken by all large insurers is COVID-19, even though it does leave contagious residue on surfaces for some period of time, and doctors disagree about the length of that period, in insurance interpretation, which is the only interpretation that currently matters, that, that infectious residue on surfaces does not constitute direct property loss sufficient to trigger the business interruption insurance coverage. So that's a pretty hard paragraph. And if somebody needs me to, I can unpack it in the Q&A. But the point is, the two usual means of transferring risk, passing it to some other party in your chain of business, you know, through a vendor or subcontractor, through contract, or buying insurance to insure against the risk, neither of those is working especially well right now. Doesn't mean you should abandon them. It just means really doing the right thing, controlling the risk as best you can. That actually is the thing that you need to do because you can't pass the risk off to somebody else very easily right now. So those are the four applications of risk management strategies. And there's one more thing that I want to tell you, and really this is a plug, but it's not a plug for me. It's not even really a plug for my organization. It's more a plug for you. Um, so I'm vice president. I have a law practice in Scottsdale. In addition, I'm vice president of a group called the Event Safety Alliance, which is an international trade association. You can see our nice logo there. We are creating written guidance for venues, events, event professionals, people in this industry who are going to get to reopen fairly soon, but who don't have a league or a team or even their own personal lawyer telling them exactly what they should be doing or thinking about, we're writing guidance for you. We're crowdsourcing this guidance. We actually have a series of Google Docs that we're using basically for your brain dump because 
you know what circumstances you're dealing with. I know how to frame the issue. You know, I just gave you kind of a framework in microcosm. But in order for this guidance to be as robust as it needs to be so that we can open as safely as we're able to, we need your help. So I've given you the URL, you know, eventsafetyalliance.org is our website. And if you go to that page, if you just click on that, right in the middle, there's a big red box. If you want to get involved in collaborating on this project, this super important project, please go to the Event Safety Alliance website, click on that nice red box, and we will get you into the drafting process. Because we're going to have guidance written and circulating by Monday, May 11. That's the date that we have set. And we set that date because by then, it seems some places are already going to be allowed to reopen. And again, whether that's a good idea or not a good idea, not for me to say, but it's the Event Safety Alliance's goal to help places that do decide to reopen to control their risks as best as they're able to. So we're writing that guidance right now. We would love to have your help. It is a humongous job and it's, I cannot think of something more important. It is literally saving lives, saving our livelihood and saving a way of life for all of us. So that's the document. There's the website. If you'd like to be part of the solution, we would love your help. Um, so there's the plug. That's me. And uh, that was my talk. So I think now we can do uh, Q&A. I think we can do a Q&A. Yes, absolutely. We totally can. Um, we've, got, we've got quite a few questions in here. Um, so Steve, do you want me just to read these out to you? Yeah, so the, let me give a, a quick caveat um, for those of you who are still writing questions. Um, we all desperately want to know what the future holds. I do too, but uh, I left my crystal ball someplace else. I don't know exactly what the future holds. I'm a keen observer of what we know now. Um, and I am blessed with a lot of smart friends, including many of you. So if you want to know exactly when we're going to reopen, I don't know. Um, if you want to know when your area is going to reopen, I don't know that either. Um, so let, let's try to focus on things that will be of mutual benefit and constructive because there unfortunately is so much that we just don't know and yet we're probably going to reopen anyway. Awesome. So um, maybe we'll just, we'll kick off with a couple questions here. I'm hoping we can get to as many as possible. Um, if we don't get to your questions, I apologize. Um, we'll see if we can answer some of those online later. Um, so first question, are we allowed to request event attendees to have their temperature taken before coming into a venue? Yes. Um, for most of you, um, good to be with ILEA, you're going to be in privately run places. So there is no, you know, in the U.S., there's no constitutional right to enter private property. You know, if somebody says, it's my First Amendment right, no, they're wrong. Um, it's not. And you can tell them that Steve the lawyer said so. So you can condition entry upon anything that you want. You know, you must wear a funny hat. You must wear a mask. You must allow us to check your temperature using one of those, you know, temperature guns that I showed you. You can condition ingress on anything or nothing. And you do, you already do. You know, people can't bring their pets. Um, you know, they can't bring weapons. You already do that. So adding one more condition or a few more conditions, sure, and you should. Awesome. Awesome. Um, when we started the, the webinar, you were talking about um, small events versus large. Can you just define what, uh, what, that, what that means for everybody on the call? No, uh, <laughs> that is going to vary with your circumstances. Here's why it matters what your circumstances are. So it could be that some municipal official is going to say events of 
fewer than 50 people can start to reopen. Uh, gyms, um, hair salons, bowling alleys, theoretically can, can max out their capacity at 50 and just make everyone beyond 50 queue up outside. I don't know if 50 is a, a good number or a bad number, but it's a foreseeable number. Other places, the municipal official will say, events of fewer than 100 people, or in other more aggressive places, 200 people. So when I say smaller, I'm distinguishing, say, an ILEA size event from a stadium or a festival. Those are definitely bigger than yours. And I don't mean that in any pejorative sense, well, with the exception that it's good to be smaller right now. It's really good to be smaller because the big events, they're not opening soon. They're not having this conversation, but you are. Right. So big events would be sporting events, um, any sort of like large, large public gathering in close proximity. Okay. Right. Um, so uh, next question. Uh, curious about the event planner role in liability of planning and executing an event during the pandemic. Is it all on the venue to keep people safe? I assume the answer is yes. What recommendations do you have for us to mitigate liability for ourselves? Um, your assumption, alas, is not correct. Um, so I, I will give you a standard line and then I'll explain. The standard line is, Steve, if I do X, can I be sued for that? The answer is yes, because in our basic common law system, uh, you can be sued for anything. Anything that if somebody wants to sue you for, they can. So the event planner, you will get swept in assuming that you have insurance because that means you have a deep pocket. Um, so will you get sued along with the venue operator, the host, the food server, the F&B company, the cleaning crew? Yes, you will get sued also. Then the question is who did a good job, who didn't do a good job? The planner, I love when people have planner in their name because that means they can plan and you are in a position to require things like temperature checking and gloves and masks. You're in a position to make those rules and then to require that other people enforce them. That's great. Um, next, next question, should registrations now have a checkbox that attendees can accept the risk of attending an event. Um, is, there any, is there any deflecting onto the attendee here? That is a great question and a very hard one. Um, I, I will give you my answer. So here's Steve Edelman's kind of roadmap to dealing with patron acceptance of their own risk. Um, what I envision is essentially a a new social contract between event organizers and event patrons. And the contract basically is, we the patrons understand, because you organizers have told us, we patrons understand that there is some risk that you cannot eliminate, that there is not enough testing, that there is not contact tracing, that there is not a vaccine, nonetheless, we really want our event. We really want to get the hell out of our house. And so we patrons accept that there is some risk that we may become ill. This acceptance means we understand. It doesn't mean we absolve you of all responsibility to wipe stuff down, do a good job keeping things clean. We don't absolve you of responsibility, but we appreciate the risk and we're not going to blame you for a hundred percent because we understand that we could stay home we're choosing not to i think that's the best that we can do right now um yeah i agree um what additional insurance policies would you suggest for event planners during this time i, I have no suggestions about additional insurance policies um, Insurance is really important. Um, please don't interpret my remarks as denigrating the significance and importance of insurance in any way. It is super important. 
the key at this point is, I think we've all learned an important lesson, which is you must have a serious grown-up conversation with whoever is selling you insurance products to explain what you want to accomplish in order to find out, is that possible with some insurance product? And if it is possible, what's it gonna cost? You're still gonna have to make a reasonable choice. You may be able to insure even against coronavirus related risk, frankly, I doubt it, um, but ask because you'd be foolish not to. But the risk of people getting sick when they go to your events is one that you're probably just gonna have to choose to accept for a while because there is very, very little incentive for insurers to insure against that risk given its high likelihood of occurring. Great. Can you explain what force majeure really means? It's been yes. coming up quite a bit. I, I can. So th this is kind of to stick in your back pocket. Um, it doesn't have a whole lot of significance anymore, but it was huge two months ago. So, you know, here's, here's the, the quick version of force majeure. First of all, it's French. Um, I will spell it. It's force, F-O-R-C-E, majeure, M-A-J-E-U-R-E. Force majeure literally translates to higher force. So in the list of the parade of horribles, usually you see act of God. That's what people think of when they think of a force majeure. There are two elements to any force majeure provision, two and only two. One, the thing that happens is not the fault of either contracting party. So a contract is between two entities. Force majeure applies to things that aren't either of your fault. Neither of you caused whatever is this bad thing that you're about to talk about. So prong one, ain't your fault, not either of you in equal measure. Part two, this is the part that people argue about. The thing that we're talking about renders performance of the contracted terms either completely impossible or so difficult that they are what's called commercially impracticable. Impracticable means Theoretically, we could do it, but it would just make no economic sense. It would be so dumb to force the parties to perform that that we're just not going to, we're not going to compel performance of this contract. So, not either of your fault renders performance impossible or commercially impracticable. Now, once you know those two things, you don't actually need the stupid list of, you know, fire, flood, severe weather, you know, Civil insurrection, you know, picture people in tricorn hats, carrying muskets, wearing red coats. No, you don't need that list because that list always begins with including but not limited to. When you see the words including but not limited to, it means the drafter is too damn lazy to come up with an inclusive list. And so they're just giving you a bunch of examples. But examples don't define define anything, the definition is in the two prongs, not either of your fault, impossible, or commercially impracticable. So we don't really care whether pandemic is in the list, the parade of horribles, doesn't matter because what a force majeure event is still a function of not your fault, impossible, or commercially impracticable. Got you. Um, thank you for that explanation. Um, we're going to have despite to all the, the goofiness, that's actually the <coughs> explanation of force majeure. Love it. Thank you. Um, we're going to have to wrap it up there on the Q&A. I know there's a lot of questions still in here. Um, we're going to do our best to get these questions off to Steve and we will, um, we'll post them with this webinar when it posts on to iliahub.com. I'm going to throw back to Kareem to um, get us wrapped up here. Kareem, take it away. You're muted, Kareem. Oh, hello. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Steve. That was uh, that was great. I just gotta pause here. So um, we have our um, 
upcoming webinars um, that will be later this week. So on Friday, we have our Clear Head, Strong Mind, the weekly mindfulness session that we've been hosting. And we're, this week, we'll have a conversation with Mike Dew, uh, CSCS, CPT, and the founder of Revive Fitness um, in, from Calgary, I believe, in Canada. Um, we will end your week with a sense of calm and a more positive mindset to help us get through these times. Last week, we had an amazing session that ended with a beautiful song from singer-songwriter Jen Beaupre. So come in just for the music alone for something fun and to change your perspective. Um, the session will start with a follow-up chat with Irene Pace, RD, and observations from this week and tips to help you um, reset your reset your your um, your outlook. Um, so please pre-register for that. Um, our next um, webinar will be looking at proactively preparing for the future events, which will be a brainstorm led by Steve Kemble on Tuesday, May 5th. The registration opens this Friday. It will feature former ILEA International President Steve Kemble, who will lead a conversation about preparing the future of live events and it, we will work together to generate a list of tactics and ideas for event profs to implement into events post COVID-19. So um, come be part of writing some new best practices, a word that Stephen doesn't like, but <laughs> we, we are gonna uh, try to do and consideration as we enter into the, the future state of our industry. And as mentioned before, so please visit ILEA Hub for a collection of resources related to COVID-19. We've got um, our webinars posted and the pages updated regularly. Um, this is where you also can go to join the future webinars. We encourage you to jump on our ILEA community and the open member forum on Facebook to share your thoughts as well as resources or solutions you have implemented during this time. If you prefer social media, we have the ILEA Member Connect on Facebook group and Instagram, where you can get up-to-date information on our weekly webinars and Zoom meetings and just connect with fellow members. Um, and yeah, so once again, just a reminder to log into ILEA Hub and, and log in and update your information so we can stay connected. And again, if you need any support, please reach out. Um, we are here for you. And thank you again, Stephen. Steve, thanks so much for this. Um, thank you everybody for joining. That was a number crushing webinar. We got a lot of people on it. I hope you got a lot out of this. Again, the questions we didn't get to, we'll connect with Steve and see if we can get some answers posted for you. Um, we hope everybody is having a wonderful day. We got you out of here on time. We will see you again on Friday for Clear Head, Strong Mind. Take care, everyone.